The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. It may be a Thanksgiving like none we've had before, but even in these strange days, there is plenty to be thankful for, and food is always on that list. So tonight, we begin talking to Chef Joshna Maharaj about why good food is more nourishing for us and for everyone up the line who makes it possible. Then, one of Canada's premier science fiction writers, Robert J. Sawyer, tells us the story of how America developed the atomic bomb, or at least how he imagines it all happened, that story 75 years after nuclear weapons were dropped on Japan to end World War II. It's Monday, October 12th, and that's next on The Agenda. Well, according to the province's protocols, extended families are not supposed to be gathering this weekend as they might normally for Thanksgiving. But good food will still be coming out of kitchens across the province. And if it was grown here in Ontario and prepared from scratch, so much the better. With us to explain why, chef and food activist Joshna Maharaj, whose new book is called Take Back the Tray, Revolutionizing Food in Hospitals, Schools and Other Institutions. And she joins us now from Leslieville in the provincial capital. And Joshna, it's great to see you again. How are you doing? I'm well, Steve. How are you? It's nice to see you. Uh, you know, one of these days, you and I really got to talk again, uh, not in boxes, but actually in, in person. But I don't know that that day's coming soon. I know, uh, but I'm really looking forward to it. I'll tell you that. Amen. Well, let's talk. I know you and Nam Kiwanuka did a formal interview about your book uh, over the summer, so mm. I don't want to repeat all of that. But uh, in anticipation of this conversation uh, for Thanksgiving Monday, uh, you did mention in your book that we apparently in this province import, I want to get the number right here, $20 billion worth of food every year, and half of that, you say, could actually be grown here. If that's yes. the case, why do we import so much? Uh, there's a lot of kind of sort of, there's a lot of silly things that stand in the way. And when I say silly, I'm talking about like trade deals. You know, NAFTA is perhaps one of those pieces uh, that has these sort of deals that stand in the way of us be having the ability to prioritize our local consumption of our domestic production. Uh, and that when when you hear, like, I think some stats or something as crazy as for every four apples that we grow here, we import another three uh, and then two get exported because of existing trade deals. Um, and really just the fact that our food supply is not protected domestically. Um, and that seems uh, insane to me, particularly at this moment in time. Could we actually make enough food in this province or in this country in order to satisfy our desires? Oh, we could. A hundred percent, right? We absolutely could. Or, or even, I don't think, like, it's not a completely black and white conversation because I think because there's limits to what we can grow here. And even if we just ate, if we all ate only the things that were grown here and only imported the things that were not, I'm talking lemons, you know, avocados, things like that, our food system would be a much stronger version of itself. So I'm trying to imagine, if we all decided tomorrow that we're no longer going to eat foods that are imported from other countries, um, mm -hmm. what would that do to the whole supply chain? What would that do to the way we do things? I mean, pretty well, disruptive, I think. Well, I think for sure. Yeah, to your point, I think we need to have a sort of weaned or graduated uh, process there because we have some very solid national and international distribution channels that are well entrenched and and supported in this country. Uh, and so what, what I am hoping for and what a lot of my colleagues are hoping for is a more gradual shift. Uh, so that we have more, we have a more robust uh, regional and local system so that in moments like this, because for sure this is not the last time we're going to have to deal with something uh, as intense as this pandemic, we have more resilience um, and ability to pivot on the ground at the grassroots level. Uh, it's not a, it's not an overnight swing thing because that will topple everything, right? We need more of a gradual weaning in, uh, and, and, and hopefully that gives us time to get the public, you know, to get the public on board, really. No, I take your point, but I, I wonder, is that something that has to happen at a political policy-oriented table? Yes. It is, eh? It's not something that individuals can just make individual decisions on. 
Well, I think I think we're seeing the reality of those individual decisions right now, right? Uh, some wonderful stats are like in the last 10 years, we've seen a 400% spike in the uh, number of uh, farmers markets uh, in Ontario. And that is a very encouraging sign that the desire for locally sourced food is as great as it is. Um, so communities can definitely uh, sort of vote with their dollars on the ground. Uh, but there is a lot of government policy that keeps those national and international distribution channels uh, as secure secure and robust as they are. And that's the kind of stuff that I would like to start uh, untangling a bit. Do you worry at all, though, Joshna, that if we decided to buy, I mean, it's impossible to do exclusively local, but let's say much right. more local, that uh, other countries in the world would do the same and not take our stuff and we'd lose markets for our goods that, that we'd want to sell to? I, I don't. I, th I think that there is. Uh, there's another way for us to support our local agricultural economy. It does not like for sure. There's a reliance on the sales that come from our exports. Um, but I don't know. I don't know that our food needs to be in that pocket, right? We have lumber. We have water. We have all these other natural resources and other bits that we export. Um, but I think that there. I think it is actually a food security issue that we don't first focus on making sure that we all have enough to eat and then consider or what exports look like, right? A focus around considering our food primarily as like agri-food business to me is a real problem. Well, let's put that agri-food business, the sort of large scale industrial size farms on the sidelines for a second. Yes. And I wanna ask you about the small scale local farmer. How is yes. she doing during the course of this pandemic? They, uh, she is struggling, uh, however, not to the same degree that we have seen with a lot of larger farmers, right? For sure, the fact that restaurants weren't buying has really sort of toppled um, the supply for others. But I, in April or so, when I started hearing the news about potato surpluses because we weren't eating fries and dairy surpluses because of cafes not being open for lattes and whatever, uh, I reached out to my local network of farmers. And I have, an, I have access to a network of about 60 or 75 local farms in Southern Ontario. And I said, please, I can help with managing surpluses and moving this stuff around. What have you got? Uh, and after about a week, Week and a half of me sort of like be, you know, telephone calls and messages, there was not one farmer that had anything to sell. Hmm. And what did you right? infer from they, that? Uh, they have figured it out, right? Because what we also saw on from these particular farmers and producers was an incredible sort of nimble uh, ability to pivot, right? They built themselves online platforms in a hurry and they literally had like parking lot and side of the road pickups organized so that people could get boxes of food and that they could still move their product out. Uh, you know, eggs from the farm gate, uh, all this kind of stuff. And that to me is, is a really important thing for us as Ontarians, as eaters to realize, right? That our local farmers can in fact take care of us. Um, I heard Steve, it was so sweet. So many people just like my neighbors and things like that are saying that they figured out, they were like, I had no idea that I could just buy my food from a farmer. <laughs> right. And I was like, yes, <laughs> it's wonderful. Isn't it? Right. And I was like, and it's the tidiest, most sustainable economic model, right? That, and that piece at this moment is particularly important. And you know what? You can do it five minutes walk from this very studio in the middle of the biggest city in the country. Yes. Yes, you absolutely can. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to ask you about, I think if we go back a few months, we do remember that there were outbreaks of COVID-19 among, for example, uh, larger farm operations, among migrant mm -hmm. workers, for example, I think mostly in southwestern Ontario. And, and beyond the obvious uh, personal difficulties slash challenges that that meant for the migrant workers, what did all of that do to the ability of farms to get food to us? It was very, very difficult, right? It was quite dramatic. In fact, I spoke with uh, a good chef colleague of mine who was had a friend who ha, you know who has an asparagus farmer, right? In the spring, asparagus was the first crop that we saw, um, and they had they had real troubles with their migrants, with their migrant, with their for you know foreign workers. Um, there were all of those issues, and so they literally put a call out to the community for people to come and help them harvest this asparagus, and they still could not manage to harvest it all. 
and had to end up, you know what I mean, just tilling it under. Uh, and we heard that a lot from a lot of large scale farms. They just did not have the human power to harvest. Uh, and a lot of this, unfortunately, a lot of this beautiful food just went to waste and did not did not get harvested. And so didn't even make it to market. Didn't get harvested. They didn't get paid for it. So the, the, the ramifications go all the way through the system. You got it. You got it. Hmm. Uh, because it topples. And, and then uh, it's there. One of, one of the other uncertainties is for farmers having no sense of what to plant, how much to plant, you know, because there are so many, so many things up in the air. What is the weather going to say? What is the market going to say? Where is labor going to come from to do all of this? And will people agree to potentially pay more for their food, uh, right? Because if we have to uh, come up with different labor scenarios, you know, to actually get this food harvested and out to market, uh, things might have to start costing more. Well, let me pick up on that. And to that end, I'll do a, uh, let's pluck a quote out of your book here. It's critical, you write, to recognize that the highly processed industrial food we're buying and serving is artificially cheap and that the planet, taxpayers, and people of the developing world are picking up the tab. Okay, let's pick that apart a bit. What do you mean by all that? Okay, so there are, uh, we call them externalities, right? These are sort of like surrounding costs that uh, are not always included in the final price tag of imported industrially produced food. Uh, we may say, uh, we look, we walk into a grocery store and we see clamshells of strawberries for 99 cents and everyone's like, it's so cheap, I gotta go get the 99 cent strawberries. But what you are not, you are not paying is the cost of the labor to do that, the cost of the, there's often monoculture uh, farming, which is like thousands and thousands of acres of the same crop, you know, and being planted for maximum yield to ensure that we can actually offer this really cheap price. Uh, right. But but essentially that food is artificially cheap. Another example is uh, a burger. Right. Uh, there's uh, there's talk around a Big Mac. Right. Raj Patel is an important voice around this. And he put together the idea that while we might pay four dollars at a retail place for a Big Mac at, a, at McDonald's, the actual environmental cost with the with the imports of the beef and the, uh, the 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 forest and the natural environment that has been cleared in order to raise cattle cheaply enough to produce this, uh, those costs are not actually being included. So the, the true cost of that $4 Big Mac is actually somewhere closer to $200. Hmm. Well, you're not going to sell too many Big Macs if you're trying to get 200 bucks per hamburger. So we're really not. That is not an option. So what are you thinking here? So we need to uh, we need to really understand one that food that appears to be very cheap is in fact not that cheap and that there are lots of costs that we are not paying, mostly in environmental impact. And second, there's a sort of socio-political cost with folks who live in parts of the world where this very cheap agriculture racket is happening and working conditions and, and, and wages and that sort of thing. Um, and so we need to actually remember that and then connect ourselves to the fact that we, we have a very robust hamburger supply really at a local and domestic level right uh it, and it may it may not be uh as cheap as what mcdonald's is offering but we need to really connect to the fact that that is uh that that is a false price tag right and that we need to we need to open our eyes to this truth well let me do a follow-up on this because i yeah. first of all let me say i totally i totally get where you're coming from i totally understand that the price that we're paying at the mm -hmm. fast food place for the burger that we get is not representative of the total cost to society. Right. I, I, I totally understand. However, um, mm -hmm. we're, we're, we are living in precarious times. We know that even before COVID hit, the food insecurity rate, according to StatsCan, was 12%. Uh, presumably that number is higher now during the pandemic because a lot of people have been going uh, without without uh, you know their regular incomes or they've lost jobs yes, or whatever. Absolutely. We have to assume that household budgets are tighter nowadays. There's a lot more to worry about on a day to day basis. So I, uh, I'm just wondering how tough it is to make the case for perfectly r responsible and reasonable r reasons that we got to pay more for food because the farmers need it and because we have to stop all of those ancillary mm -hmm. costs related to our environment yeah. and so on. Is that a tough sell? Yep. Uh, 100%, right? And that my work lies a lot in the middle of exactly that, right? It is a very tough sell because I could only go so far advocating for people to spend more of their income on food. Uh, what if you have no income, right? Or what if, you know, what if you're, you're, what if you're choosing between terrible things like keeping the electricity on and putting food on the table? Um, and that is, 
that is really a distance that is yet to be reconciled because we are seeing major spikes in the number of people that are walking through the doors of drop-in centers and food banks for meals. Uh, and now that the uh, you know emergency benefit is tapering off to some degree, uh, we are that's an increase is there. And so a lot of the work that I find myself doing is caught in the tension between these two places because we do have folks in this country who can in fact afford to spend a little bit more money or who can be sort of convinced and argued into redistributing their, you know, and reworking their priorities. But then we have a bunch of other folks who, for whom that is almost an insulting suggestion, right? right? Uh, and we really need to consider this. Now, all that's to say, Steve, I was in the grocery store yesterday and I bought a cauliflower the size of my head <laughs> for $1.99. Right. And I have spent a lot of time in my kitchen figuring out I live alone. So that cauliflower is going to go a long distance. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is there is this other piece. Right. Locally sourced food uh, in season is very affordable. Right. We have bumper crops. We have easy access. Um, and so then we start moving into uh, cooking skills and kitchen availability and that kind of stuff, because when people don't have the skills to actually process raw ingredients and cook themselves food, they're more dependent on those uh, falsely four dollar burgers. Right. Hmm. Uh, and so it's it's like it's a bigger sort of systemic uh, change that I am trying to push for, because if we had more food, food security includes food skills knowledge, right? And the ability to actually produce food for yourself, not just buying it, but like a kitchen, uh, you know what I mean? And some knowledge about how to put this all together. Mm -hmm. Though Those are all the pieces that still need to grow in order for this to work the way I see it. Well, humor me for a second then. If, if yeah. 199, I mean, that's a, that's a great price for cauliflower yeah. that's gonna last you for a very long time. But if you want to check off all the boxes of the socially responsible things that you just referred to, including farmers getting a, a decent fair price for their yes. food and the environmental issues you raised, what should that cauliflower cost? Well, uh, that's a great question. It is a great question uh, because there is, I think it could be anywhere from, um, be, like the $1.99, it's still possible to sell it at that price and pay uh, pay a decent you know uh, pay a decent price to a farmer. It's not we're not suggesting that the dollar ninety nine means an undercut to a farmer. There's a way to make that work right in season right now at this time. It's perfectly expectable to pay between three and five dollars for a head of cauliflower. We have seen uh, as sort of other weather patterns and things change in other parts of the world where we import cauliflower from, we've seen them get as high as eight or nine dollars, hmm. which that feels outrageous, right? I, I think that the, the head of cauliflower cap should be about four or five bucks. And if we did pay that much, uh, and I don't, don't misread me here, this is not meant to be a facetious question, but if we did mm -hmm. pay that much, how would the world be a better place? Well, with the there is there is like a domino impact, right? Because if we have farmers who are making uh, a better, more living wage, right? Because the the prognosis for farmers in Ontario is not great. Average age is fifty five, um, and they most of them need off farm income to keep them living above poverty line, right? So if we can have more security for our farmers, we have uh, then their job is easier. And then and then we have. Uh, more sort of collective investment in this place and this economy, there are longer term impacts of much more sustainability um, and resilience, right? And the resilience is a piece that we're really looking for. If we invest more in this place and our people here, uh, we are going to we are going to be in much better shape to take care of each other and make sure that we all actually get fed. OK, one more on this, and that is if yes. you're trying to access good local food and let's say you don't live particularly near to a farm, which most okay. people don't now. And yep. let's say for whatever reason, you don't live close to a farmer's market that may come into your neighborhood on the weekends or something like that. How yep. do you access good, healthy local food? Uh, there are a number, your your grocery store can still serve you very well here, hmm. right? And sometimes, it, depending if you live in a remote enough place, you sometimes it's just a conversation with the produce manager in that store uh, about where they're getting stuff from and where, you know what I mean? And and to to let them know that there's a community of people in that, you know, who shoppers who use that store who would like to see more local produce, right? And it's particularly if we're talking about a place in this province somewhere, uh, those networks exist. Uh, and there are plenty uh, grocery store produce managers 
who are very amenable to this idea, right? They themselves get it. They understand that uh, that that having the the local harvest on their shelves is a more desirable thing, particularly at this time of year. Um, so it's still very very possible. Don't discount your grocery store as a source. Uh, you just may have to work a little bit harder to find the stuff. Gotcha. Okay. In our remaining moments here, I do want to raise the issue of people's eating habits during the course of this pandemic. Yes. Do you, Themi, we all know, we've seen all the stories about how people are doing more cooking and they're doing more yep. baking and, you know, uh, you're stuck at home, you come up with novel ideas of stuff to do. Do you yes. think the pandemic has actually changed people's eating habits? Uh, 100%. Uh, it is very clear and it seems to be happening in two directions. One is uh, people have really surrendered themselves to indulgence, which is lovely, right? Tons and tons of comforty starch eating is happening. Uh, so much so that we are like pushing back on pants with buttons and, you know, things like that. <laughs> uh, right. That is happening for sure, which is cute. Uh, but the other side of it, I am seeing beautiful things like uh, people talking about how they have never had this many dinners in a row with their family, mm -hmm. right? They've never sat down. Uh, they've discovered that their kids are way more competent in the kitchen than they ever imagined they might be. Uh, and so the family routine and dynamics have changed now that they can actually uh, allocate the kid to cook one entire meal with a lot of confidence and success. Um, and I'm also seeing people... Um, uh, really connect to traditional recipes, right? I think times of stress and uncertainty have really pulled us into uh, a connection to history. Uh, and and people, I've, I've heard so many beautiful stories about people surprising themselves with what they can cook and making really beautiful connections to generations before them uh, with, even, you know, because they have the time to get down and make this serious lasagna or to, you know, let something, you know, proof, you know, soak overnight or do whatever nice thing it is. Uh, that is popping up all over the place. And I could not be happier about that. <laughs> well, all right. Let, let's do one more comment on this then. And that is, uh, while this is a wonderful development, can you imagine that this will persist once the pandemic is over and we're all back to our busier social lives, et cetera? Uh, I have my fingers deeply crossed about this, right? <laughs> they say that it takes 21 days to develop a new habit. Uh, and we've had definitely more than that time. Uh, and so I, the optimist inside of me is really hoping that the positive impacts from that investment in cooking and in dinner time and some regularity with your family has really shown itself to people, right? Uh, and that we are clinging to it to some degree for some comfort and some connection. So I have been anxiously awaiting seeing this, right? Uh, there I have also, I need to be honest and say that I've had conversations with people who are like, I am done with cooking. I don't want to do any more. I am ordering, you know what I mean? People have had enough. Uh, and, and it's sweet. Is that enough, food, enough, of, enough of the new way of cooking or enough of being with their family every night? I, well, this is it, just like <laughs> cooking and dishes and just enough. Uh, so I'm sure for not everybody, you know, this is not always joyful, but I am so, so hopeful that some of this will stick because I think that people have been given an opportunity to, to learn something that they would have never had the opportunity to connect to. Well, I'll tell you what, I always learn new things when I talk to you. So that's why I'm grateful uh, to have this opportunity. Happy Thanksgiving to you, Joshna Maharaj. And let's remind people your book is called Take Back the Tray. Thank you. She's a chef. She's a food activist. She's a podcast host. She does it all. Uh, take good care, and we'll talk again soon, I hope. Wonderful. Happy Thanksgiving, Steve. Thank you. <laughs>As you may know, TVO turns 50 years young this year. And as part of our ongoing celebration, we've been looking back into our archives for some gems, such as the one we're about to show you. It first aired for Thanksgiving in 2005 on our program Studio 2. Happily, it features two artisanal Ontario cheese producers, both of whom are still going strong, Montfort Dairy and the Upper Canada Cheese Company. Have a look. Well, my understanding of an artisan cheesemaker is that you buy milk from a small group of either goat herders or shepherds, and you process their milk into specific cheeses. And that usually those cheeses are made in small batches and handled a fair bit. So there's a lot of hands-on work that goes in that kind of cheese making. 
I was a chef for 20 years, almost 25 years, and I had some great jobs. And the last job I had was at the Stratford Festival, and it was fabulous. I got to be mum for 800 people. But cooking is also a career that's harder to get old in, and I knew that I needed to make a shift, and I wanted to take the same skills and do a job that was gentler. And I'd always been interested in cheese, and so I had kind of a contained midlife crisis and that it was time to make a change, and I quit cooking and started making cheese three years ago now. I'd uh, been involved, you know, in winemaking, and then I was spending a lot of time in Quebec and uh, the person that I was seeing down there uh, got introducing me to all these great little cheese places where they had 30, 40, 50 head of cattle and they uh, were making just these great cheeses. In Ontario, our values as far as food are different. And my understanding from the time I have spent in Quebec is that the farmers are paid more for their milk and, um, and their products, and the consumer is willing to spend more on products. When I got back, I went to the library, took out every book they had on cheese making in St. Catharines, um, found a source of some molds and the different things that I would need to start making it, um, found some milk, uh, and uh, one day I just uh, was prepared, and a friend of mine, Martin, came over and we made a batch of camembert cheese. I've learned mostly by the seat of my pants and by making a lot of really expensive mistakes. And um, I think that's something we need to look at in Canada is how we can end up training cheesemakers and setting schools up like they have in Europe and especially in France. But right now, the only way for me to learn is to take a book and pick a cheese that I'd like to replicate and that I have the right conditions for. And then um, usually the instructions will say uncooked, unpressed curd from sheep milk. And uh, so you just do it and you try and put it in the right kind of molds and treat it with the right kind of environment and hopefully you get something like what you're trying to get. We have access to some very good milk and just like wine making, good milk can make good cheese, uh, good grapes make good wine. So I've made arrangements with the dairy farmers of Ontario to have milk from a farm delivered here every day. I um, was aware that the the Comforts had some Guernsey cows up here. And when I decided that I wanted to start making cheese, I just came and sourced them out. And this morning we're working about 800 litres of milk. And half of it's goat and half of it's sheep. And we're doing some blends too, so. I have contracts with individual shepherds. And so they need to be one where there's respect for each other. I need to pay them appropriately for their product and they need to therefore give me quality product that I can then work with. So there are stipulations that I put on about how I want the animals treated, the kind of food that I want the animals to have, and the kind of humaneness with which they farm. Those are really, really important issues for me. One of our selling points is all our goats have to be fed non-GMO. Uh, food, like the grains non-GMO, non-GMO corn, most hay is non-GMO. Because I demand that, then I also try and pay more than is often offered for milk. Um, and I just think that kind of respect for what they're doing, it really matters. So therefore, hopefully I can sustain them in a kind of ag agriculture that makes sense. We've just started making these goat cheeses and the curd is so soft and so gentle that you get divots in the bottom because it doesn't. So we're trying a new method today where we're going to sieve it a little bit through this. See, the French say you should take it out. You shouldn't even cut it. You should take it out with ladles. Goat milk I like a lot. I like goats. I like their intellect. I like, I just like them a lot as animals. I think they're way smarter than sheep. but. I have to say, it's um, more tender and fragile milk to work with. I have to be much gentler as a cheesemaker and um, much more fastidious. What these cows bring to cheese is they bring that higher protein, they bring that uh, higher butter fat, they bring that carotene, they bring that A2 casein, which gives it a real richness. It gives it that color. If you look at the cheese just naturally, uh, it's got some carotene, it's got some yellow to it. The milk is just entirely different. It's creamy colored, almost like a, 
the height of these animals rather than white. My hope is that we end up with, I don't know, three or four hundred different small dairies in Ontario, at least. I think the more there are, the better it is. The more competition there is, the better it is, because it means that I need to make my cheese better in order to get the consumer to buy my product. The cheeses being made by Upper Canada um, are very labor intensive. The camembert style here, this comfort cream, is uh, hand flipped, it's hand salted. The washed rind is um, washed three times a week by hand. The cows are grass fed and it works its way through into the flavor profile of the cheeses. The flavors of these cheeses, uh, mushroom is used a lot as a descriptor. They're, um, they can get strong with some age, but they're mild, but they do have taste. They've got flavor, they've got real taste. And then it's golden Guernsey, and this is all natural. Well, these ones are all cheeses that are artisanal in that they're ripened, and they're all made by hand. We have, um, this one's called Paradiso, and it's a washed rind. It's made a bit like a telegio, except out of sheep milk. And I wash it two or three times a week with a uh, brined water, and, um, I bring linens in from France, they're called linens or bacteria that give the cheese a particular flavor from the outside. So they stay quite moist. And then I have a shepherd's cheese, we call it Toscano. It's made like a Tom de Savoie, it's a type from France. And then with it, you brush the mold back into the cheese so it stays dry and there is mold on it, but it's sort of contained. All of these cheeses come out of my ripening room where I run 80% um, humidity to 85% humidity, and I like my temperature between 10 and 12 degrees. This is the ripening room where we keep all of our cheeses for uh, anywhere from a few weeks to a few months. Some of them are very old. Uh, this whole row of cheese here is the same type, more or less. It's our Toscano cheese, which is a firm cheese. The stuff at the end here is fresh, and it's about uh, a couple weeks old. And then it goes all the way down here, and these ones are as old as 12 months. And then as they get, they stand here longer, they get a bit firmer, they get, the salt goes up. But we send these ones out usually about three months old. These down here are fresh cheeses that start out uh, nice and soft. And then after a few days in here, they get rubbed with, with olive oil and peppercorns. And then after a month or two, they end up looking like this. So the mold gets introduced naturally. I would expect to see more cheese operations coming on the market, um, particularly probably down here in the peninsula. The most important thing, more than anything, more than me making cheese or anything, is finding a way to make farming viable in Canada, right? That's all that, that's all that really matters, I think. So. I think we're starting to become our own country. I think we've done that with wine. I think we've done it with breads. And I think we're now uh, starting to do it with cheese and other products. And I think there seems to me an impetus to buy Canadian and buy local and be proud of who we are. It was 75 years ago this past summer that the world saw the first and thankfully only use of nuclear weapons in human history. Despite knowing nothing about the nuclear program when he was Fra Franklin Roosevelt's vice president, it was President Harry Truman who made the decision to strike Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan with nuclear weapons, thereby bringing World War II to an end. How did America develop the bomb in the first place? Well, Canada's finest science fiction writer has speculated on that in his latest novel called The Oppenheimer Alternative. And it brings Robert J. Sawyer back to the agenda tonight from glorious downtown Mississauga. Great to see you again, Robert. How are you? Steve, it's great to see you as well. I'm doing fine despite all the madness in the world today. I'm doing all right. I'm really glad to hear that. Before we get to the nuts and bolts of the story, I am intrigued by the fact that you wrote this book despite not having a publishing contract beforehand. How come? Absolutely. There were a couple of reasons, but the biggest was I got tired of having deadlines. I had been a book a year writer for most of my career. I'm 30 years a novelist now. There are 24 books out now. And very sadly, a few years ago with my penultimate book, my younger brother got diagnosed with and ultimately died from lung cancer and I asked to be released from my 
contractual deadline. And the publisher said, just deliver whenever you're ready. And I realized that without in any way rushing the book, I was able to produce what I thought at the time was my best book ever, Quantum Night, my penultimate book. And now I decided I don't even, you know, financially, I don't need the advance up front. And so I will finish the manuscript and present it to a variety of publishers and find what ideal deal I can find for the book. Gotcha. Okay, I'm glad to have that story out of the way off the top here. Let's tell the story that you do tell now. Who is the Oppenheimer in the Oppenheimer alternative? J. Robert Oppenheimer, he contended that J stood for nothing, uh, was in fact an astrophysicist prior to the war, but he's the man who was tapped by General Leslie R. Groves, the actual leader of the Manhattan Project, which was the International Canada United States and Great Britain effort to create the world's first atomic weapons, he tapped Oppenheimer to be the scientific director of the Manhattan Project, largely because unlike just about every other scientist that Groves interviewed for the job, Oppie would provide direct answers, including the one that most people are loath to say, which is, I just don't know. Nobody <laughs> knows. It's too new a science. Anybody who is telling you an answer to that question is just making it up. They literally don't know. I'll tell you when I know, and I'll tell you when I don't. And that was good enough for Groves. Now, is there a particular connection we should know here between J. Robert Oppenheimer and Robert J. Sawyer? That just seems too coincidental to be, I don't know, you tell me. You know, and the thing is, of course, I, uh, he went by his middle name, Robert. So I was in the position of writing a novel uh, about a man whose name I couldn't change because he was a historical figure who used my own first name as if it were his first name. And so I would say, Robert did this, Robert did that. And it, there was a lot of cognitive dissonance, <laughs> I have to tell you, Steve. Now, the, the project, of course, became known as the Manhattan Project, but it was in New Mexico. So why did they call it the Manhattan Project? So every project under the Department of Defense was designed, assigned to an engineering office. And it happened that the paperwork was at the Manhattan Engineer District in Manhattan, New York City. And simply because of where the paperwork uh, work originated, and of course, the last thing you want is for, and there certainly were, German spies and Russian spies infiltrating the work. The last thing you wanted was to call it the New Mexico Project and give away <laughs> where the hiding place was. So this bit of administrative banalia that it happened to be Manhattan where the paperwork was filed was good enough for a code name. Now, of course, America got the bomb first. However, in 1939, you tell us Albert Einstein told President Franklin Roosevelt at the time, this is before the war started, you really need to start developing a nuclear slash atomic bomb. How did FDR take that advice? So FDR was not immediately seized by it. And many things passed the president's desk. And he had to be reminded several times to look at it. Ultimately, Secretary of War Henry Stimson, who had also served as Secretary of War in World War One, so he served it in both world wars, said, look, you really got to look at this letter. It's Albert Einstein, for God's sakes. And when FDR finally read it, he said, we got to do this. We have to do it. Unlimited budget. Whoever it takes, whatever it takes, get it done. And that's when it was turned over to Groves, who was known as kind of a fixer. His positive reputation at that point, General Groves, was that he had, uh, it wasn't quite complete at that time, but he was the man who had been selected to build the Pentagon. Later, his negative reputation that we don't talk about much anymore was as one of the chief army engineers, he also built all of the internment camps for Japanese American citizens who were thrown into internment camps simply because of their racial origin uh, during the war. Well, let me stay with that ethnic angle if I can for a second, because, um, well, you point this out in the book, it, it can't be a mere coincidence that many of the scientists who were involved in the project to develop the first atomic bomb uh, had Jewish backgrounds. And of course, Absolutely. their confreres in Europe were being destroyed in the Holocaust by Germany. And I wonder how much you think that motivated them to get to the finish line and, and presumably ultimately hope to use that bomb on Germany. Well, this is exactly it. The goal originally had never been Japan. The goal had been to put an end to Adolf Hitler 
and the Third Reich. And so the target city was, of course, going to be Berlin. And the problem is that the Manhattan Project utterly and completely failed in its mandate, which was to build an atomic bomb in time to defeat Germany, because Germany was ultimately defeated by essentially Russian troops, not uh, American or British troops, but Russian troops pushing in on Berlin to the point at which Hitler said, I'm better off dead than facing a war crimes trial. And so Hitler, with one bullet from his Luger, did what $2 billion of American, mostly science and technology, had failed to do, which is come up with a weapon that could stop Adolf Hitler. And at that juncture, Steve, many of the scientists, particularly as you say, the ones of Jewish descent, many of them said, well, what are we doing this for now? It, it's over. I mean, thank God. And it turns out we sent missions in immediately to determine whether Germany was even close to having an atomic bomb of their own, and they were not. So, okay, we're done. And no, Leslie Groves, the military said, uh-uh, everybody continue until we actually defeat Japan. And not with one bomb, but with two. We've got two competing designs. Thin man, very straightforward physics. And fat man, revolutionary physics using the manufactured element of plutonium. I want to test them both. I want to test them on civilian targets. The project continues until that is done. Hmm. Okay, Robert, you, I mean, you, you have used historical documents, you are talking about real life events, obviously, yeah. but this is a novel. And um, I guess what I need to get a better understanding of, and let's go through a few examples fairly briskly here. I need to know what's real and what's Robert J. Sawyer's mind working overtime here. For example, yes. you've got Oppenheimer marrying someone and becoming her fourth husband, is that true? Absolutely true. Wow. He married uh, Kitty, who became Kitty Oppenheimer. And yes, Kitty had gone through husband after husband after husband. Two divorces prior to Oppie and uh, one husband, Joe Dalt, who had died in the Spanish Civil War. Did she really entrap Robert Oppenheimer into marrying her by getting pregnant? You know, this is the difficulty of writing this novel in our enlightened time of the 21st century. The Kitty, she was cat-like in that. Yes, she absolutely did, and bragged to her friends. I, she said, quite literally, I quoted in the novel, and it is from the historical record. I got him, meaning Oppie, J. Robert Oppenheimer, I got him to marry me the old-fashioned way. <laughs> I got pregnant. Now, did he really sneak off the most secure research facilities base in America so he could have a tryst with a former lover? Yes. Oppie was one of these geniuses, and he was without any question a genius, who thought he was so clever that he could get away with anything. And, uh, you know, if you talk about Greek tragedy, they talk about the hamartia, the fatal flaw. That was his fatal flaw. He thought he could get away with anything. And his uh, mistress uh, and former lover, Jean Tatlock, had sent word to Los Alamos that she was in emotional distress. And Oppie contrived an excuse. She lived in San Francisco. Um, uh, Ernest Lawrence, who was instrumental in the creation of the atomic bomb, was still working at the University of California, Berkeley, just across uh, the bridge, uh, the Golden Gate Bridge from San Francisco. And so he contrived an excuse to go see Lawrence, really so he could duck out and spend a night with Gene Tatlock. And this was a big part of his ultimate downfall, was the hubris the incredible hubris of thinking he could possibly be unnoticed when he did that. Yeah, Robert, that's just absolutely crazy. I mean, it, to, it, what if he'd been kidnapped? What, what if something had happened to him? I mean, the whole course of the outcome of the war could have changed. Did he not appreciate this, that? This is exactly it. General Groves was absolutely convinced that Oppie and the other senior scientists, Edward Teller, we know these names from history, Enrico Fermi, Hans Bethe, that they were all likely kidnapped targets who would either be enticed with incredibly rich appointments on the Axis side or simply tortured to give up their secrets to the Axis side, either way. <laughs> and there was a no-fly edict 
which Oppenheimer defied for his trip home, actually, uh, largely because not only were they concerned about kidnapping, but they were also concerned about simply back then flying was not the safest mode of travel. We're talking the 1940s. Mm-hmm. And you could die in a plane crash, and he could not be risked. So Oppenheimer, this was his downfall, was that he would not see the big picture the way it was required of him to see it by the military. Well, of course, he was very successful in leading to uh, leading his team to the creation of the first atomic bomb. And after the first successful test, I'm going to read two statements here, and I want to get your sense of which one you yes. think is more accurate. The test is done. Good, look at us, look at what we have achieved, or, oh my God, we now have the capability of destroying the entire world. Which gets closer to the truth? So for Oppenheimer, at the moment of the first test, I actually think he was very delighted. He showed up at a a meeting at uh, Los Alamos doing the standard victory strut across the stage, hands raised. He did it again when the bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. It was only when three days later, this word didn't exist in our vocabulary back then, overkill. We use it all the time now. Well, that's overkill. But Oppie was, in fact, one of the very first to ever employ it. And he said, the bombing of Nagasaki, just 72 hours before... Uh, Tokyo, the government in Tokyo had had a chance to even assess what had happened. That was overkill. It was unnecessary. And he transitioned at that point and maintained for the rest of his life an enormous melancholic regret over what he had wrought. He felt we had gone quite literally a step too far in bombing Japan twice in such rapid succession. Hmm. All right. Let me get you to to rewind the clock just a few months because I want to take you to the end of well, I guess VE Day. We're talking May 1945, victory over Germany. And suddenly, a lot of German scientists who've been working on their own weapons programs, um, well, America's got to make a decision about them. Uh, a lot of them yes. came to America. Scientists like Werner von Braun, who invented the V-2 rockets. And here's a quote from your book about that. They'd agreed that when the time came, they would surrender as a unit rather than let the Allies pick whom to employ and whom to execute. They'd also agreed that they couldn't stand the French, who could, that the Soviets were animals, and that the British wouldn't be able to afford anything as grandiose as a peacetime British experimental rocket group. That left the Americans. Most of the rocketeers had never met a Yankee, and what knowledge they had of their country came from movies, but the Germans knew a real devil here. One they didn't know surely could be no worse. Robert, did the Americans not feel the slightest bit queasy about welcoming all of these former Nazis into their fold? So the Americans had been given, the American soldiers who were stationed in Germany, had been given a list of Nazis that were not wanted for war crimes, but wanted because of their scientific knowledge. And as soon as the group that often, it was actually uh, Werner von Braun's brother Magnus, who had surrendered on behalf of the group because Werner himself actually had his arm in a cast and couldn't ride a bicycle down the mountain from where they were hiding, uh, where his his brother could, walked into town, looked for a German soldier and said, my name's Magnus von Braun. You don't know me. My brother, Werner von Braun, invented the V2. You'll want to talk to him. And that they already had orders from the Allied powers and particularly from Washington. You betcha we want to talk to him. We want him to come work for us rather than for Stalin and the The Russians and whatever post-war world was going to emerge. Hmm. Now, going forward a few months, did Oppenheimer and any of his team, were they consulted by the White House on whether or how to drop the bombs on Japan? Yes. And Oppenheimer had participated in that process. Uh, The initial targets, Leslie Groves drew up the first list, the military head of the Manhattan Project, presented it to his superior, his ultimate superior, the Minister of War, Henry Stimson, and Stimson scratched off Kyoto. He had been to Kyoto previously. Uh, He loved Kyoto, and he knew it was of great spiritual uh, uh, significance to the Japanese. He said, no Kyoto. And this very much frustrated Groves, who felt it was an ideal target. But yes, Oppie himself had served on the target committee, which had gone through, They'd right at the outset of the war, 
the United States had said, we will not firebomb a half dozen or so Japanese cities. Everything else is fair game, including the capital, Tokyo, which was severely firebombed. We're going to leave a half dozen pristine, untouched, so that we can test in combat the actual effects of an atomic weapon. You drop an atomic bomb on a city that's already been firebombed halfway to extinction, you don't get the data about how effective the atomic bomb was. And so, yes, Oppenheimer was instrumental in the decision and ultimately did not speak up when conscience might have dictated that he should have and said, you know, we should eliminate the civilian targets, such as Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and only leave places like Kukura, which was an armory, as potential targets. And they clearly disregarded his advice. Uh, you've got him quoted in the book as saying he felt like he had blood on his hands. Is that an actual he quote? He absolutely said that, 100% true quote, to which, uh, I don't know if you can say this on TV Ontario, Go President for it. Truman said after he left the office, I never want to see that son of a bitch in this office again, referring to Oppenheimer, because Truman very much, he was the first nuclear president, remember. Mm. And the protocol we have today was not in place. The protocol today is only, God help us, Donald Trump can order the use of nuclear weapons by the United States right now, only the commander in chief. Back in the day, it was the opposite. Only the commander in chief had final veto authority to stop what the military had planned to do. So uh, 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 Truman could have said, no, 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 don't do it. But it was going to go ahead without him actually saying, yes, you have permission. But ultimately, nonetheless, Truman took on the mantle and said, if anybody's got blood on his hands, he was the one, remember, who had that sign on his desk, the Missourian, who had that sign that says the buck stops here. And whatever failings he might have had as a president, he took that very seriously. Mm -hmm. He said, it was my decision. Oppenheimer, you're just a cog in the machine. I don't care what your feelings are in this matter. Well, having said that, you mentioned Edward Teller earlier in our conversation, and you've got him quoted in the book as saying, I have no hope of clearing my conscience. The things we are working on are so terrible that no amount of protesting or fiddling with politics will save our souls. How representative was that quote of the group of scientists who worked on the bomb? I, so it's an absolutely true quote from Teller. It's not particularly representative of Teller. He very much he became Ronald Reagan's uh, chief proponent of Star Wars, the missile-based strategic, uh, space-based anti-ballistic missiles strategic defense initiative, and to his dying day. Uh, he went on to become the father of the hydrogen bomb, the much more powerful, by which I mean two, three orders of magnitude more powerful than atomic bombs that we live in fear of today, the H-bomb. Uh, he was the father of that. He very quickly got over his pangs of conscience. But for almost every other person involved, indeed, with the exception of Teller and the military head Groves, who maintained both to their dying days that they had done the right thing, Every other scientist came either immediately or over the passing of time to regret very much what they had wrought because they came to realize it had never been necessary. Hmm. Robert, I want to spend our last couple of minutes just asking you a couple of personal questions, and that is, given your interest in science and you having now written this book, how much do you wish you had been there in New Mexico, in the desert, back in the day, to watch these guys do their thing. You know, there had never been a Congress, a gathering together of such scientific geniuses before or since. In that narrow sense, to see them all together in one place, to see the greatest scientific minds of the post-quantum mechanics revolution. So you set aside Isaac Newton, who lived in a simpler time. But in our modern paradigm of physics, to get to meet, shake hands with, this was pre-COVID-19, say <laughs> hello to, it would have been a wonderful experience. But my God, I would have liked to have taken each and every one of them by the lapels they surely had back in those days when scientists dressed like businessmen and said, you don't need to do this. Japan is suing for peace already. They're making back-channel overtures. All they want is a guarantee that Hirohito, their divine emperor, will continue to sit on the throne, which he did for another 48 years after the war. All they want 
is that one concession and they will stand down. You never have to use this monstrosity on human beings. Hmm. Now, Oppenheimer, of course, died. He died fairly young. He was only 62 years old. He died in 1967. Yes. However, his son, Peter, who was four years old, I guess, when his father died, he's still alive. He's a man in his late 50s. And I want to know if you've ever met him or talked to him. So Peter was four years old when the Trinity test happened. Oh, I see. Uh, when his father died, he was a grown man. He was a, he grown, was a grown man, man yes. By that point. Um, Peter is still alive, and I deliberately do not seek him out. And this is the novelist's prerogative. Uh, Robert Oppenheimer has no right of reputation at this point. No dead person does. Anybody can say whatever they want about the dead. Good taste notwithstanding. I feel I'd fairly treated Oppenheimer, but suppose I had said to Peter, now, Peter, I'm thinking about writing a book about your dad, and he said, oh, God, Rob, please don't bring up his infidelity to my mom one more time, you know. <laughs> I know he went off and saw Gene Tatlock. I know he brought, but come, do we have to dredge that up? Well, yeah, we kind of do. So Peter is the only still living character in my novel. I hope he will read it and judge it a fair portrayal of his mother and his father and his sister, who was committed suicide subsequently, who's also in the novel. But I felt if I'd asked permission as a polite Canadian, I'd be constrained by whatever response he gave, and that would have limited my artistic creativity. I totally get it. Uh, you've done another fantastic job, I have to say. I love reading your work. The Oppenheimer Alternative is worth people's attention, and I hope you sell a million copies. Robert J. Sawyer, thanks so much for being on TVO tonight. Thanks, Steve. And that is the agenda for Monday, October 12th, 2020. Happy Thanksgiving to one and all. 50 years ago this month, Canada was in the midst of what became known as the October Crisis. Tomorrow, we'll look back at those dramatic events and their lasting significance for Quebec and the country as a whole. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.